Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series is on the book of Hebrews. It's entitled, In These Last Days, The Message of Hebrews. Did you think that Hebrews was talking about the last days? Well, let's see what it says. This is lesson number 10 in our series from March 5 of 2022, entitled, Jesus Opens the Way Through the Veil. Let's begin as usual with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we bow before you asking your presence with us as we consider these major issues in the book of Hebrews. Help us to see the truth and to recognize the role that we should play in trying to help to wind up the, the message for this world is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. It's hard for us even to imagine the emotional heights and lows that the disciples and the other followers of Jesus went through between the time when they arrived in Jerusalem for that final Passover. Remember, they came up from Jericho with a whole crowd of people, and the, everybody's mind was, okay, we're going to go to Jerusalem, and we're going to crown him king. Between that and uh, 47 days later, as they walked with Jesus across the Mount of Olives and watched him ascend as angels were saying he would return. If it was you having spent years with him, how would you feel if you knew that a close personal friend, someone you would spend a lot of time with, you know, traveling and walking and sleeping together and so forth, was now sitting at the right hand of God in heaven? Every time they prayed, did they visualize Jesus as at God's right hand? More than that, Jesus had made some spectacular promises to them. Jim? John 14, verses 13 and 14. And I will do whatever you ask for in my name, so that the Father's glory will be shown through the Son. If you ask me for anything in my name, I will do it. American Bible Society, 1992. Okay. Je Jesus' ascension marks the moment that the new covenant, which provides the means through which we can approach God boldly through faith, has been inaugurated. It is our privilege to approach God with confidence through Jesus and the merits of his righteousness. Adult Bible City Guide for Sabbath, February 26. So the question is, there's some uh, sort of dark speech in that. What, what is that supposed to mean? Let's see if we can figure that out. What are the merits of his righteousness? And for those who have st of us who have studied theology down through the years, you know that um, the Roman Catholic doctrine on merits is that if someone's a real saint, and of course Jesus was the ultimate saint, um, they would do lots of good things, and so when they die, they have a lot of extra merits. They don't need all those merits to be able to enter heaven, so they can share merits that, um, the extra merits they have. And um, we don't buy that as Adventists. So how does that relate to the fact that Christ has defeated the devil by answering his questions before the universe and disproving his misrepresentations about God? This lesson will focus on what changes have taken place following the ascension of Christ to heaven. So that's what we're going to talk about. What's he doing now in the heavenly sanctuary? Carrie? This comes from the Good News Bible, Hebrews 9, verse 24. For Christ did not go into a holy place made by human hands, which was a copy of the real one, he went into heaven itself, where he now appears on our behalf in the presence of God. Okay, and then the matching relatively, well, that's sort of similar, John 16, 25 to 27. These are Jesus' own words. I, I keep Go ahead. going. All right. I have used figures of speech to tell you these things. But the time will come when I will not use figures of speech, but will speak to you plainly about the Father. When that day comes, you will ask him in my name, and I do not say, and in brackets it says, notice that word, 
not which so many ignore or leave out as they read this text because it does not fit their paradigm. That I will ask him on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you. He loves you because you love me and I have believed that I come from God. Okay. So, did Jesus just throw out the entire Old Testament sacrificial system with those words? It's not a bad analysis. Well, here's what our Bible study guide says. God instructed Israel that their ma males should go three times every year up to Jerusalem. Now, they later recognized that there wasn't going to be possible for every male to do that, but that was, that was the goal. To appear before the Lord with an offering. The appointed times were the Feast of Passover, or Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Weeks, which otherwise called Pentecost, because it came 50 days. Pentecost means 50 days. It came 50 days after Passover. And the Feast of Booths, Exodus 23, 14 to 17, and Deuteronomy 16, 16, the Passover celebrated Israel's deliverance from Egypt. Pentecost celebrated the barley, barley harvest. And of course, barley is the first crop that you, you harvest in the spring. So that was basically talking about the new harvest beginning. And by the time of the New Testament, it was associated with the giving of the law at Sinai, which of course happened not that long after the exodus from Egypt, right? The Feast of Booths celebrated God's care for Israel during their sojourn in the desert. According to the New Testament, all the Old Testament feasts also have prophetic significance. Prophetic significance. That's from our Bible study guide. So the first two were 50 days apart. Mm -hmm. The third one... The third one came, so basically... So the, they all went home Yeah. after the first one. Then 50 days, about, they came back. Yes. And then about two, about two and a half or three months later, they came back again. So this is more spring, summer, fall. And fall. Kind of. September, October is the time to come back. Somewhere in there. So the, the, the entire mail, they came in three different times. I think when you read, well, what is it in Detroit? The that they were coming. They were well, coming. back in the days when they were all camped around the tabernacle, it was easy. Right. But when you live in Galilee, and it, it, we'll talk about this in a moment, it got to be quite, quite a process. So uh, it's interesting to notice that Jesus, Jesus fulfilled many of the symbols from the ancient sanctuary system on the exact day when each was being celebrated in Jerusalem. Charles, you want to talk about that? Jesus fulfilled the pilgrim feast prophetic significance with an amazing accuracy. He died on the day for the preparation of the Passover at the ninth hour, the moment which the Passover lambs were sacrificed, John 19, 14, Matthew 27, 45 to 50. Jesus was resurrected on the third day and ascended to heaven to receive assurance that his sacrifice had been accepted, John 20, 17, 1 Corinthians 15, 20. When the priest was to wave the sheaf of ripe barley, the first fruits, Leviticus 23, 10 to 12. Then he ascended 40 days later to sit at the right hand of God and inaugurated the new covenant on the day of Pentecost. So this is mm -hmm. following exact sequence of the Old yep. Testament. That's in the Bible study guide. So he, he did each of those things at exactly the right time. When they were camping in the desert, it's easy to see why Israel would be expected to attend those special ceremonies three times a year. However, when they were scattered in Palestine from southern Judea to northern Galilee, it was difficult for all the males to go to Jerusalem three times a year. Under normal circumstances, the people from, because they, 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 they didn't think it was safe to travel through Samaria, so they had to travel down to the southern part of, of Lake, just south of Lake Galilee, cross the Jordan River, travel south through Perea to an area across from Jericho, then cross the Jordan River again and travel up the steep hill to Jerusalem in order to attend those ceremonies. That was normally about a one-week journey each way. 
That, of course, was in addition to the time they would spend in Jerusalem during the ceremonies themselves. Imagine making such a journey three times a year. So we're talking about most of a month, and you're doing that three different times in the year? Christ did at least once, right? One of oh, those. multiple times. Multiple times. Yeah. But uh, as a child, 12 years old, yeah. they came. Mm -hmm. Well, considering the following about those trips for religious purposes to Jerusalem, and here's from our Bible study guide again, the purpose of pilgrimage in ancient Israel was to behold the face of God, quote, unquote, Psalm 42, 2. This meant to experience God's favor, Psalm 17, 15. Similarly, the Hebrew expression to seek the face of God meant to ask God for help and other references. That's from our Bible study guide. We must assume that away from Jerusalem, the ordinary people did not receive much in the way of careful instruction about how to serve God. Now, that's not completely true. There were members of the tribe of Levi that were scattered around all over the country, and they instructed the people uh, about so forth. But you couldn't offer your lambs. In, that kind of stuff had to happen at Jerusalem itself. The visits to Jerusalem were supposed to bring them into his presence spiritually, in God's presence spiritually. Well, what would be an equivalent experience in our day, Jim? Hebrews 6, 19 and 20. We have this hope as an our anchor for our lives. It is safe and sure and goes through the curtain of the heavenly temple into the inner sanctuary. On our behalf, Jesus has gone in there before us and has become a high priest forever in the priestly order of Melchizedek. Good News Bible. Okay, does it give you assurance to know that Jesus Christ lived his life as he did on this earth and then died and rose from the, from the dead and went to heaven where he is now continuing to answer Satan's accusations against us? Does the realization that Jesus is now in heaven alongside the Father and along with the Holy Spirit defending us against the accusations of Satan, does that give us assurance? What do we know? How, what do we know about what they're doing up there? Let's see if we can get some clues. Kerry? Uh, taking uh, from Romans 8, 26, 31 through 34. In the same way, the Spirit also comes to help us, weak as we are. For we do not know how we ought to pray. The Spirit himself pleads with God for us in groans that words cannot express. So the Holy Spirit is pleading on our behalf. Go ahead. In view of all this, what can we say? If God is for us, who can be against us? So the Father is on our side also. Go ahead. Certainly not God, who did not even keep back his own Son, <coughs> but offered him for us all. He gave us his Son. Will he not also freely give us all things? Who will accuse God's chosen people? God himself declares they're not declares them not guilty, who then will condemn them? Not Christ Jesus, who died, or rather, who was raised to life, and is at the right-hand side of God, pleading with him for us. So, here we have, in Romans 8, the suggestion that who's, a pleading, who's pleading on our behalf in heaven? The Holy Spirit, the Father, and the Son. So who's accusing us? Charles, you want to read that? Zechariah 3, 1 to 5. In another vision, the Lord showed me the high priest Joshua standing before the angel of the Lord. Okay, now let's stop for a second. Who is Joshua and why is he here? Joshua was the leader of Israelites after... Okay, this, was not the, this is not the Joshua that led the children of Israel after Moses died. This is the Joshua who was the high priest following their return from Babylon. Zerubbabel and Joshua came back from Babylon and they're just trying to figure out what they're going to do with this mass of rubble that they have in Jerusalem, trying to rebuild Jerusalem. So this is the time of Ezra... This Zerubbabel is the time, yes, just Nehemiah. before just before Ezra and Nehemiah, yes. So this Joshua is just before, okay. 
He was a high priest, high priest. Had not, the, not the Joshua who was the leader in right. Moses' day, right, but right, this right. is the high priest. And there beside Joshua stood Satan, ready to bring an accusation against him. The angel of the Lord said to Satan, May the Lord command, com condemn you, Satan. May the Lord, who loves Jerusalem, condemn you. This man is like a stick snatched from the fire. Okay, so let's be clear here. Who's accusing us? Satan. Satan is accusing us. And what is God's response when Satan does that? He turns and condemns Satan. Satan. Yes, okay, go ahead. Lord, Lord, rebuke. Joshua was standing there wearing the filthy clothes. The Which angels, represent what? Our sins. Yeah. The angel said to him, the heavenly attendants, take away the filthy clothes this man is wearing. Then he said to Joshua, I have taken away your sin and will give the new clothes to wear. He commanded the attendants to put a clean turban on Joshua's head. They did so, and then they put their new clothes on him while the angel of the Lord stood there. New King James, New okay. Good News Bible. And we, of course, that should remind us of the story of Job. What happened to Job? God calls the meeting in heaven. And Job's, and Satan shows up claiming that he's a representative from planet Earth. And God says, have you thought about my servant Job? Was he bragging a little bit or what? <laughs> I mean, God? <laughs> yeah, he was. He was. Rightfully. Yeah, there he was. He had all the rights. He knew Job. Yes. Satan didn't know Job. I'm sure he thought he knew Job. And this is another case... There are a couple of times in history that we know about. There are probably other times, but a couple of times we know about when Satan realized that here's, and, and of course the, the ultimate example is Jesus. Satan said, every human being who has been born to this earth so far has committed sin. I am going to get this child to sin. Mm -hmm. And he failed. But here is a case of Job a little bit like that. We don't know of any sins that Job committed. He was a very faithful... God says he's what? A righteous and right. upright man. Righteous and upright man. So that's a pretty hard to get a, a better testimony than that from God, right? Mm. Mm. So here's this, the, the same situation. Now, just a matter of just a bit of trivia here. Why are they putting a turban on Joshua's head? Because he was from Middle East. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that's part of it. Okay. It does, by the way, it resonates to me, for example, my upbringing, you know, because the turban makes sense. Not yeah. Westerners, it may not make sense, but putting a turban. What was his position? He was the high priest. Yeah, so that was a normal apparel for the high priest. high priest. So they're putting, they're dressing him according to the high priest's normal attire. We just, in case anybody has a question about why they're doing that, that's the way he's supposed to be dressed. Okay? So, Daniel 7, 9 and 10. We're trying to establish exactly what's happening in the court in heaven. So far, we, so far we have Satan accusing, and we have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit defending, right? Okay, Daniel 7, 9 and 10. While I was looking, thrones were put in place. One who had been living forever sat down on one of his the thrones. His clothes were white as snow and his hair was like pure wool. His throne mounted on fiery wheels was blazing with fire and a stream of fire was pouring out from it. Now, who could that be? God himself. Yeah, has to be God. No, nobody else has that kind of a situation. But here's the part we wanted to add. There were many thousands of people there to serve him. And who would those be? The redeemed, perhaps? Well, probably not yet we're getting there but these would be angels. angels and millions of people stood before him now the term here my translation says people uh, these are beings the court began its session and the books were open so in addition to God defending and Satan accusing who else do we have there millions what is what is it what does the Bible say 
10, uh, um, 10,000 times 10,000, which is 100 million, and thousands and thousands. So there's a lot of people in this court. Then the one who has been living forever came and pronounced judgment in favor of the people of the Supreme God. Who is the one who is living forever? Only one being is living forever, right? That have to be God. So God pronounces judgment in favor of the people of the Supreme God. The time had arrived for God's people to receive royal power. It is hard for us even to imagine the experience of the children of Israel living through the plagues in Egypt, traveling through the Red Sea, arriving at Mount Sinai, and then having that epiphany at Mount Sinai. And epiphany, epiphany, of course, is a, a, a technical word, a theological word for God's appearing, coming down and, and appearing to, to people on this earth. Uh, notice what Paul said about that. And before we do that, did they just sort of feel that after a while, get the impression that, well, miracles are just an ordinary kind of thing? Mm. I mean, you know, think about it. They're, what are they doing now? They're eating every day a miracle. And, uh, They're drinking every day a miracle. And the cloud. And the cloud is up there, and the guiding. Keep it, giving a night light. Right. I mean, imagine having God as your night light. And then a, cl a cloud to, pro to protect you from the sun during the day. And you just, after a while, think, oh, that's nothing. That's just, that's just normal. Right? Just normal. <laughs> well, anyway, what does Paul say about all of that, Jim? Hebrews 12, verses 18 to 21. You have not come as the people of Israel came to whatever you can feel, to Mount Sinai with its blazing fire, the darkness and the gloom, the storm, the blast of a trumpet and the sound of a voice. When the people heard the voice, they begged not to hear another word because they could not bear the order which they said, I, excuse me, if, which, if uh, even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling and afraid. Good news, now, Bible. Before we move on, let's talk about that for a moment. Here's God sh sh sounding a trumpet. We don't know what kind of trumpet. In those days, a trumpet was a, a ram's horn that had a hollow down to it, and they would play it on one end and so forth. But I don't, obviously, God is not limited to anything like a ram's horn. He probably, whatever he uses. But I, I think, I'm, in fact, I'm quite sure, considering their response, that every time he spoke, what happened? The ground shook. The mountain shook and the ground shook. I don't know, would that be kind of scary? <laughs> More or less. <laughs> More or less, okay. That's a non-committal <laughs> answer. Well, God tried to establish in their minds two apparently conflicting realities. I want you to think about this. Two conflicting realities. He warned them not to get too close to the mountain or they would be destroyed. However, at the same time, he wanted a personal relationship with them. How could a God accomplish such a dichotomy? Is that... I think, that, I think right? reverence is needed. Don't take it for granted. Yeah. Maybe they never had earthquakes. <sighs> and he was just warning them. Keep back. Well, that's just a, a vibrating table they were standing on. <laughs> yeah, well, I, but I can tell you that, that they were living in one of the most earthquake-prone places in the world. Now, I don't know exactly what the earthquake history was at that point in time, but I used to live near the Rift Valley down in California, and it's, it goes all the way from Turkey right down through the Middle East, over into Africa, and right on down to East Africa. And there's a huge valley there, and that valley is there because the earth is just... Well, it goes clear up to Jericho, that rift, doesn't it? Well, yeah, and it goes it, right it, down it, past it, Jericho, yeah, yeah. 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 So the whole Jordan Valley, a thousand feet below sea level, why is it like that? Hmm. Because the earth has just opened up and <laughs> collapsed. So uh, they should have known something about earthquakes. Okay. Carrie, I think that's yours. Uh, reading from Exodus chapter 19, verses 10 through 15. And the Lord said to him, in brackets, Moses, 
Go to the people and tell them to spend today and tomorrow purifying themselves for worship. They must wash their clothes and be ready the day after tomorrow. On that day I will come down on Mount Sinai where all the people can see me. Mark a boundary around the mountain that the people must not cross and tell them not to go up the mountain or even get near it. If anyone sets foot on it, he is to be put to death. If now, why do you think God would say that? Let, let's try to set the setting here. Why is God saying this? Is it because there's so much of his glory on the mountain that if anyone approached it too close, they would be consumed? That's one possibility. Or is there another possibility? And his love, but there is also reverence, law and order in there. I think that's important. I think oh, even though we feel so comfortable uh, about our Abba Father, however, his office demands respect. Res yeah. Respect, that's important. Yeah, so for sure, at least he's saying respect right. my presence, okay? He must either be stoned or shot with arrows without anyone touching him. This applies to both men and animals. They must be put to death. But when the trumpet is blown, then the people are to go up to the mountain. Now let me interrupt for again for just a second. Think about you. You've got maybe a couple million people camped at the bottom of this mountain, including, and they were having a lot of, they were having children right and left. So you've got a lot of teenagers and people like that. What do you think those kids are going to do? <laughs> They're curious, right? Curious. Panic, maybe? Well, I'm, I'm saying, what are the chances that some of them are going to say, well, what's going on up there? Let me, let's go look. Yeah. I, I suspect that's why God is saying, and I want you to understand, this is serious stuff. Make a boundary. Nobody's to go past it. Okay, go ahead, Carrie. And Moses came down the mountain and told the people to get ready for worship. So they washed their clothes, and Moses said to them, Be ready by the day after tomorrow, and don't have sexual intercourse in the meantime. And that's from the he's, Good News Bible. So he's getting real graphic here, isn't he? Very specific. So he's saying, I, I, I want you to think about my presence. I want you to think about that I'm coming to talk to you. I don't want you to be distracted by anything, okay? However, there were some who were allowed to ascend part way up that mountain. Hmm. Okay, Charles, it will be your turn now. Yeah, Exodus 24, 9 through 11. Moses, Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, those are the two kids of Sons, sons Aaron. of Aaron, yeah. And so many of the elders of Israel went up the mountain. And they saw <clears throat> God of Israel. Beneath his feet was what looked like a pavement of sapphire and blue as the sky. I don't know how that strikes you. That would be pretty awesome, wouldn't it? A pavement of sapphire? Whoa. Some of you have seen uh, pictures of the, the Hope Diamond. Yeah. I think that's a sapphire, that deep blue. Wow, it would be beautiful. Go ahead. God did not harm these leading men of Israel. They saw God. And then they ate and drank together. Huh? Oh. They ate and drank with the Lord Himself. That's what it says. That's what it says. Yeah. So what's what, what does that tell us? It says, if I tell you to stay out, stay out. If I tell you to come in, you can come in. So this isn't this isn't some you know dire thing, some disease or something there that nobody can approach. If God God says come come, but if God says stay away, you need to stay away. You need to obey God's directions. I think that's the point, is that he says, I want a relationship, however, there has to be boundaries, you know, yeah. and he said it mm -hmm. there. Well, how do the children of Israel feel about that, those directions? Deuteronomy 5, 25 to 27. I remember Deuteronomy consists of three sermons that Moses gave at the, at the camped in the plains of, 
Baal Peor, across from Jericho. There's this flooded Jordan River in between them. They haven't crossed yet. And or Abraham, I mean Abraham, Moses is basically reviewing for them their history. So here's what he says about, not at the time when it happened, but he's reviewing what happened, talking about it later. Deuteronomy 5, 25 to 27. Moses recounted what the people had said. But why should we risk death again? That terrible fire, that's God's presence, will destroy us. We are sure to die if we hear the Lord our God speak again. Has any human being ever lived after hearing the living God speak from a fire? Did they know anybody who, had, who was alive after speaking? Moses. Well, all of them. They had all heard God speak. This is at the very end of their 40 years. Why are they so concerned? Go back, Moses, and listen to everything that the Lord our God says. Then return and tell us what he said to you. We will listen and obey. Of course, that's what they said back at the time when it happened. And what was Moses' response? Jim? Exodus 20, verses 18 to 20. When the people heard the thunder and the trumpet blast and saw the lightning and the smoke, smoking mountain, they trembled with fear and stood a long way off. They said to Moses, If you speak to us, we will listen. But we are afraid that God, excuse me, are afraid that if God speaks to us, we will die. Moses replied, Don't be afraid. God has only come to test you and make you keep on obey and make you keep on obeying keep, you keep on obeying him so that you will not sin. Good news Bible. Okay, so we've got two different stories here. Up here in Deuteronomy it says uh, why should we risk and and you know and so forth and even earlier than that we read that they were tra everybody was trembling. But here Moses said, y you don't need to be afraid. So Earlier they had that, that sat down and had a meal. You mm -hmm. don't do that in pa with pagan gods. No. No, you there's, sure there's don't. No. So God's manifestation of his holiness at Mount Sinai was to teach the people to learn to, quote, fear or respect him. Reverence. Reverence, him. I think that's yeah. the word to me. The fear of the Lord leads to life, wisdom, and honor. Deuteronomy 4.10, compare Psalm 111.10, Proverbs 1.7, Proverbs 9.10, Proverbs 10.27. And also to the lesson that he is merciful and gracious, Exodus 34, 4-8. Thus, while God wanted Israel to come to him, the people became afraid and requested for Moses to be their intermediary. That's an interesting word. Let's talk about that. The description in Hebrews of the events at Sinai follows. Primarily, Moses reminded to the, uh, Moses' reminder to the people of their lack of faith and their apostasy with the golden calf and how he was afraid of meeting God because of their sin. So what's happening here? Moses isn't afraid. He went right up into that mountain twice, didn't he? he, he basically, he just marked up, marched up that mountain right into the fire. Well, he was alone for 40 days. Yeah, exactly, with, twice with twice. God. Mm -hmm. But when he came down and he considered what the people were doing, he wasn't afraid of God. He was afraid of what was going to happen to them because of their sin. Okay? The people's reaction was not God's plan for them. It was instead the results of their faithlessness from our Bible study guide. Notice that this is the first time that a mediator is mentioned in the Bible. And it was the people who asked for it, not God. Very important point, okay? Now that Jesus has ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, how does he want to relate to us? We've already noted in previous lessons that his primary reason for coming to this earth was to teach us the truth about the Father, okay? That was Maxwell's theme. Well, Ellen White's theme, too. Here, we'll see. Carrie, are you the next one here, I think? Oh, boy, yes. The law of Jehovah was burdened with needless exactions and traditions. Mm. And God was represented as severe, exacting, vengeful, revengeful, rather, and arbitrary. He was pictured as one who could take pleasure in the sufferings of his creatures. 
the very attributes that belong to the character of Satan, the evil one represented as belonging to the character of God. Jesus came to teach men of the Father to correctly represent him before the fallen children of earth. Okay, so what's happening here? Satan has been incredibly successful at getting people to believe the wrong things about God. He, has, in fact, has actually foisted on people his own ideas, his own character, saying that, well, God is really, you know, arbitrary, exacting, revengeful, unforgiving, severe, those kinds of things. And so Jesus is coming to correct those things. Go ahead. Angels could not fully portray the character of God, but Christ, who was a living impersonation of God, could not fail to accomplish the work. The only way in which he could set and keep men right was to make himself visible and familiar to their eyes. Christ exalted the character of God, attributing to him the praise and giving to him the credit of the whole purpose of his own mission on earth to set man right through the revelation of God. Amen. In Christ was arrayed before men the paternal grace and the matchless perfections of the Father. In his prayer just before his crucifixion, he declared, I have manifested thy name, I have glorified thee on the earth, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. When the object of his mission was attained, the revelation of God to the world, the Son of God announced that his work was accomplished and that the character of the Father was made manifest to men. That's from Miss Ellen G. White, The Signs of the Time, January 20, 1890. That's John 17, verse 4 yeah. is what that is all about. right? And there. Romans 3, verses 25 and 26 as well. Mm. Yeah. Was, wasn't this the night before when he says, glorify yourself in me as yep. I have glorified yeah. you? It was yeah. the night before. Right? Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. So, and, and, and Jesus said right here, I have finished the work which you gave me to do. There are so many people who believe that the only reason for Jesus coming to this earth was that he could die and pay the penalty for our sins. And there, that is not in the Bible. That is no. purely made up by so-called theologians and misguided Bible teachers and pastors. Well, what it does, it gives a bad picture of our Heavenly Father. Yeah. That's what it does. Yeah. 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 Yeah, they, 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 they think, they call it a sacrifice, they think God wants a lot of stuff. Right, really, right, right. <laughs> He's happy when you get stuff. Completely bypassing Psalms 54, um, he, Christ came to vindicate the character the of God, the character. that He's love. Yep. Yeah. Yep. That's exactly. Here we're turning it all around. In this. Another pastor that some of us know here uh, said that Jesus came to do, vindicate their, or let, Humans are here to vindicate God's character. And somebody else we, we know says, no, that wasn't the case. But that guy that said that was wrong. I'm not going to mention his name here. but There were three curtains that served various functions in the ancient court, tabernacle in the wilderness. The first one was at the opening of the tabernacle. Uh, at, I'm sorry, the, of the courtyard. Oh, yeah, right. The next one shielded the entrance to the holy place. These curtains were supposed to be for the protection of the people and especially the priests. We know the story of Aaron's son, Nadab and Abihu, who went into the temple apparently under the influence of alcohol and may have actually tried to go into the most holy place. Mm -hmm. uh, notice this warning in Leviticus 16, 1 and 2. Charles? The Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron who were killed when they offered unholy fire to the Lord. He said, tell your brother Aaron that only at the proper time is he to go behind the curtain into the most holy place because that is where I appear in the cloud above the lid of the covenant box. If he disobeys, he will be killed. Okay, the two sons got drunk. They went into the holy place. They carried strange fire, refu refusing to follow God's directions, and they were killed. And God says, uh, this is serious. If, if, if you, even you, Aaron, 
if you uh, try to go over there and, and mm -hmm. into the most holy place at the wrong time, we know that Jesus came to this earth, veiled his divinity with humanity, and did, he, and did his best to get close to the Israelites in his day. And we have John 1, 14 to 18. The Word became a human yes. being full of grace and truth, lived among us. We saw his glory, the glory which he received as the Father's only Son. John spoke about him. He cried out, this is the one who I, I was talking about when I said he comes after me, but he is greater than I am because he existed before I was born. One of the full, out of the fullness of his grace, he has blessed us all, giving us one blessing after another. God gave the law through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only Son who is the same as God, and is the, at the Father's side, he has made him known. Once again, try to imagine what the universe, and that, that of course was from our Good News Bible. Once again, try to imagine what the universe must have thought as God himself came to live in the midst of a group of escaped slaves and called them his people. Just think about it. Wow. Now that Jesus has finished his ministry on this earth and ascended to heaven, he is inviting us to follow him into the most holy place in the temple in heaven. Is that a safe thing for us to do? Going into the most holy place in the temple in heaven? He's inviting us. He's inviting us. Jim, I think that's yours. Hebrews 10, verses 19 to 22. We have then, my brothers and sisters, complete freedom to go into the most holy place by means of the death of Jesus. He opened for us a new way, a living way, through the curtain, that is, through his own body. We have a great priest in charge of the house of God. So let us come near to God with a sincere heart and a sure faith with hearts that have been justified from a guilty conscience. Purified. Purified, excuse me. Have purified from a guilty conscience and with the bodies washed with clean water. Good news, Bible. So what's happening here is he's saying that Jesus is coming to this earth should teach us that it's safe to approach the Father directly. What do you think that portion Jesus of... Jesus is known as Almighty God, Everlasting Father. And himself. And, that, and he, there was nobody between him and everybody else. We've already read John 16, 25 to 27, uh, which very clearly says, you know, there's no, Jesus doesn't need to plead to the Father for us because he's, he's welcoming us himself. There's no reason why we cannot approach the fa even the Father freely. As Jesus entered the most holy place in heaven as served as a high priest, let us not forget that Exodus 19, 4-6 and 1 Peter 2, 9 make it clear that we are to serve God as priests. So what's the work of the priest? To educate. Educate, represent God to the people, right? Teach, them, teach about God, represent Him. The ascension of Jesus to the throne of God starts a new era for the people of God in the antitypical Day of Atonement. What is Jesus doing in heaven right now? Well, we already read Zechariah 3, 1 to 5, and what do we know? We said, okay, Satan is accusing. All three members of the Godhead are defending. And who's the jury? The angels. Hundreds of millions of angels, okay? What would it be like to hear Satan spelling out before the entire universe all your sins and why you should not be allowed to enter heaven? Can you imagine hearing that? That'd get better boring after a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, especially it goes from one person More to the same. next. <laughs> Maybe it was yeah. almost they have a loop tape. <laughs> okay, he was eleven. Who's next? That's Probably be, I guess. Yeah. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. To have faith is to be sure of the things we hope for, to be certain of the things we cannot see. That's from the Good News Bible. While true, this is not the whole meaning of this passage. We also have arrived at Mount Zion in the very presence of God through our representative, Jesus. 
That's Ephesians 2, 5, 6, Colo what's that? Colossians, Colossians 3, 1. 3, 1. Uh, Jesus' ascension is not a matter of faith, but of fact. It is this historical dimension of Jesus' ascension that provides compelling force to the exhortation of Hebrews to hold fast to our confession. Hebrews, that comes from Hebrews 4.14, Hebrews 10.23. And I'll serve a school Bible study guide for Thursday, March 3. Okay, so what, is he, he's, what he's trying to say to us here is the fact that Jesus, as a human being, he has assumed his humanity and he will retain that humanity for all eternity. And he has ascended to heaven. He's now seated at the right hand of God in heaven. So what can we say about human beings? It's possible for us to be saved, right? And be taken to heaven. Okay? Um, this is made very clear in several places in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 7, verse 15 through 17. On the other side, one of the elders said, That is why they stand before God's throne and serve him day and night in his temple. He who sits on the throne will protect them with his presence. Never again will they hunger or thirst. Neither sun nor any scorching heat will burn them, because the Lamb, who is the center of the throne, will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of life giving water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Good News Bible. Okay, Revelation 21, 1 to 4, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth disappeared, and the sea vanished. And I saw the holy city of the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared and ready, like a bride dressed to meet her husband. I heard a loud voice speaking from the throne, Now God's home is with human beings. Mm -hmm. He will live with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and he will be their God. He will wipe away all tears from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more grief or crying or pain. The old things have disappeared. Revelation 22, 1 to 5. The angel also showed me the river of the water of life, sparkling like crystal and coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb and flowing down the middle of the city street. On each side of the river was the tree of life, which bears fruit 12 times a year, once each month, and its, its leaves are for the healing of the nations. Nothing that is under God's curse will be found in the city. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and His servants will worship Him. They will see His face, and His name will be written where? On their foreheads. They shall be no more night. They will not need lamps or sunlight because the Lord God will be their light and they will rule as kings forever and ever. Good news, Bible. Okay, so what's happening? You want to go ahead and pick that up, Jim? Just as soon as the temple, excuse me, just as soon as the people of God are sealed in their foreheads, it is not any seal or mark that can be seen, but a settling into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually, so that they cannot be moved just as soon as God's people are sealed and prepared for the shaking, it will come. Indeed, it has begun already. The judgments of God are now upon the land to give us warning that we may know what is coming. Manuscript 173 and 1902. And other, many other references other, rep there. other places. All who enter will have on the robe of Christ's righteousness and the name of God will be seen in their foreheads. This name is a symbol which the apostle saw in vision and signifies the yielding of the mind to intelligent and loyal obedience to all of God's commandments. Ellen White, Youth Instructor, August 18, 1886. Okay. Care, you want to pick that next one? Yes. Christ's ascension to heaven was the signal that his followers were to receive the promised blessing. For this they would await before they entered upon their work. When Christ passed within the heavenly gates, he was enthroned amidst the adoration of the angels. As soon as this ceremony was completed, 
the Holy Spirit descended upon the disciples in rich currents, and Christ was indeed glorified, even with the glory with which he had with the Father from all eternity. The Pentecostal outpouring was heaven's communication that the Redeemer's inauguration was accomplished. According to his promise, he had sent the Holy Spirit from heaven to his followers as the taken that he had as priest and king received all authority in heaven and on earth and was the anointed one over his people. That's from Ellen G. White, Acts of the Apostles, page 38 and then 3 through 39. You want to go ahead and read the next one as well? They could speak the name of Jesus with assurance for was was he not their friend and elder brother? Brought into close communion with Christ, they sat with him in heavenly places. With what burning language they clothed their ideas as they bore witness for him. Again, from Ellen G. White, The Acts of the Apostles, 46.1. I mean, I, I, in studying these lessons, I have tried to think Try to, I always try to, when I think, so I say, okay, what would I have done? How have I, would have I have been impacted if I had been under that, in those circumstances? Try to imagine that you had spent two or three years traveling with Jesus every day, daytime, nighttime, everything. You, you had, he was your best friend. And now all of a sudden, he is, you, you recognize that he's God and that he's, sitting beside the throne of God in heaven. Hmm. I just, it just blows me away when I think about that. That's why their lives were so transformed. Mm -hmm. When he was gone from the earth, they yeah. realized who they're walking with. Do you feel comfortable with the idea that through prayer we can approach God directly? Or do you feel more comfortable praying in the name of Jesus? Well, Jesus didn't say, I mean, <laughs> he, he is God. To, yeah, he is God. So they, we, we don't have uh, a barrier between he, him and uh, our, ourselves. You want to take that next one, Hebrews Charles? Hebrews 12, 23, 22, 23. Instead, you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem with its thousands of angels. You have come to the joyful gathering of God's firstborn, whose name are written in heaven. You have come to God, who is the judge of all people, and to the Spirit of God, spirits of God, good, good people, people made perfect, good news Bible. One of the challenges of understanding, I think that's yours. Yeah, one of the challenges in understanding this passage of scripture is the question, who are the spirits of the righteous made perfect, Hebrews 12, 23. Are they disembodied spirits as many Christians think? Okay, who are the spirits in the, of the righteous made perfect? Most scholars, now we're gonna get a little, a little deep here and I might skip over a part of this because it gets a little complicated. Who are the spirits of the righteous made perfect? Some scholar, most scholars of the book of Hebrews employ Jewish apocalyptic literature. This is non-biblical, apocryphal or pseudepigraphical references and their jubilees, Enoch, 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 apocryphal, Baruch, to understand the phrase spirits of the righteous made perfect. On this basis, they conclude that these spirits must be immaterial souls. What is an immaterial soul? Devoid, Devoid of the body, who are dwelling in heaven. Such a conclusion needs to be challenged by the date data presented in the book of Hebrews itself. So let's look at that. To that end, we will analyze the, the noun spirits, the adjective righteous, and the adjectival verb participle made perfect. The noun spirits or spirit has three different uses in the letters, letter to the Hebrews. First, spirits is used to designate angels who are ministering spirits, mm -hmm. Hebrews 1, 7 and 14. Second, the Spirit designates the Holy Spirit, who gives gifts, speaks about the New Covenant, and bears witness to it. Hebrews 2, Hebrews 3, Hebrews 6, Hebrews 9, Hebrews 10. Sometimes the Holy Spirit seems to be described as the Spirit of Grace. Hebrews 10 again. Or the Eternal Spirit, Hebrews 9. Third, spirits refers to human beings 
who are alive and who are subject to the piercing penetration of the living word of God. Similarly, when Paul ta talks about God disciplining his children, he says, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of the spirits and live? So who's he talking about there? Clearly he's talking about us, isn't he? Human beings. So the father of the spirits, that's us. Thus we can conclude that the spirits in the phrase, the spirits of the righteous made perfect, are not angels, not the Holy Spirit, but human beings who by faith have approached Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. The term, term made perfect appears several times in Hebrews yielding three uses. First, Christ was made perfect through sufferings and becomes the source of eternal salvation. So, in order for us to understand that God came down to this earth and he was really a, a human being, we, we needed to have a record of his living from birth right through until the time when he was killed. We could see that's a real human being. Um, Second, the law cannot make perfect the conscience of the worshiper. Third, human beings are perfected in Hebrews 10, 14. Paul says, for by a single offering, he, Christ, has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. Uh, and we're running out of time here. I'm moving forward. In some, the textual evidence points to the fact that the noun spirits is used for angels, Holy Spirit, and humans. But in this case, it clearly is talking about humans. As Seventh-day Adventists, we held many beliefs in common with other Christian denominations, such as prayer, righteousness, and so forth. But we have other special things, such as the, our teaching about the sanctuary. As Seventh-day Adventists, we are distinguished from other Christian groups, though not exclusively. And I think we need to conclude there. We believe that God created Adam from the dust of the ground and so forth. Through the influence of Greek philosophy, most Christians have adopted these other ideas and there we'll have to close. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, we have come to discuss these things and to try to understand a little bit more complicated aspects of the book of, Revel of, book of Hebrews. We thank you for the privilege we have of studying together and sharing with those who are listening and, and, and watching us. Be close to each one of them and help them to understand uh, better than they have before these issues is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.